just a, a bit about me um, and you know, apologize also for you know, one of the images getting corrupted last minute. Um, you know, Frank mentioned my history in the department and, uh, and then you know, starting into 3M, uh, I, I hired into a, a consumer laboratory and uh, worked on consumer products. I'll talk about my, my first uh, new product introduction program uh, in just a moment. Um, and following that, moved into management roles where I've uh, you know, uh, progressed uh, through a number of different organizations, uh, had a, a, a fairly broad range of different experiences, all um, you know, residing here in St. Paul. Uh, but touching a, a fairly uh, diverse set of products and research groups and uh, functions uh, within the uh, technical organization. Uh, and then on the personal side, uh, married with four wonderful kids. Uh, the oldest is 15, uh, and then the youngest is uh, yet three years old. This picture uh, of all of us was taken uh, fairly recently. And uh, in addition to uh, the professional and, and family activities, uh, we've been fortunate to uh, get invited to, to serve on a couple of, uh, a few actually nonprofit boards over the years, um, and currently involved in two now. One is Minnesota Community Care, uh, the state's uh, largest federally qualified health clinic. And we provide uh, health care to uh, everyone who shows up at the door, regardless of um, ability to pay, uh, insurance status, uh, or uh, you know background, uh, and so as a result, you know naturally uh, have a, a over representation of underserved populations here in the Twin Cities, uh, and then also serve on the board of directors for the 3M Foundation. Uh, so I get a chance to um, help to influence the uh, you know, allocation and direction of uh, some of 3M's uh, giving activity and community engagement. So um, <laughs> this was a, an interesting exercise. I was actually trying to find some, some uh, digital images and copies uh, and uh, realized over the years, you know, the, the, the files can pile up pretty quickly. And so uh, I was very pleased to see that my thesis was right uh, within arm's reach. Uh, and so I just thought I'd uh, give a little background uh, because it does lead into some of the work that I've done uh, at 3M. Uh, on my uh, thesis research. So um, working in Frank's group, um, you know, studied as others have, uh, blockopolymer phase behavior. We did anionic uh, polymerization, uh, NMR uh, characterization, uh, and, um, and then you know, investigated uh, structure property relationships, uh, phase behavior, and in, in my case of uh, ternary block copolymers and blends thereof. Uh, and so in the images here, you can see just the you know, synthesis schematic, um, some uh, rheological characterization of blends of tri-block copolymers. And, you know, we saw for blends of um, block copolymers having different polymerization order for the blocks, uh, that the modulus of the elastic modulus of those blocks uh, was heavily dependent on composition. So an interesting result there pointed to uh, morphological differences in the bulk. Uh, and so we were able to map the phase behavior with uh, TEM and X-ray scattering. And, you know, I'll, I'll refer to this lower right chart uh, later on um, as we did uh, small angle X-ray scattering to characterize the phase behavior. Uh, we, uh, you know, made note not just of the uh, Bragg diffraction peaks, but also of this sort of diffuse um, scattering uh, that uh, was indicative of, uh, you know, some um, broad-based composition variation at uh, length scales intermediate to um, the periodic phase behavior for the microstructures. And so, um, you know, that was something I stared at quite a bit while I was a graduate student. And as I went into some of my earlier uh, work at 3M, you know, I made some uh, natural connections as I'll be able to show in a moment. So, uh, you know, hired into 3M, I interned there. And um, you know, I spent uh, you know, the, the summer between undergraduate at Fam uh, FAMU, Florida a and uh, and going into the grad department at uh, Amundsen Hall. Um, and you know, just strengthened my resolve that going to get uh, a PhD was, was important uh, for me. Um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the uh, opportunity to leverage technical creativity and um, 
uh, you know, insight and high level research to improve the human condition. And, you know, thinking about what 3M has evolved its vision and, and value statements to reflect, it aligns very well with things that I'm passionate about, you know, technology, products, and innovation, uh, advancing, enhancing, improving, uh, a broad uh, intent, every company, every home, and every life. Uh, and so, you know, it's sort of an expansive vision that aligns with um, things that I believe I can aspire to and uh, at the same time takes advantage of, you know, skills that, that I, I have and can develop. Um, and then on the value side, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, increasingly apparent to, to us as a company the, the criticality of diversity and inclusion. Uh, and you see that showing up in the, the statement at the very top of our values. This is a corporate slide, not mine. And you know that that word in the middle, equity, is is new. Um, and you know, just thinking about the 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 year we've had, um, the, the impact of COVID nineteen, um, the the very prominent uh, social and civil unrest associated with disparities uh, that we you know we're all aware of here. Um, you know, three M is embracing its uh, leadership role in the country and in the community. Uh, to 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 support and um, and help combat disparities while at the same time providing uh, equitable access uh, to um, you know all of the the backgrounds and interests uh, represented among our population and I'd add that it's partly around a moral stance but it's just as much around a business viability uh, perspective as well because we we cannot compete with one hand behind our back or one fraction of the brain power uh, available to us. And so you know, we have to make uh, inroads for everybody to participate in the innovation ecosystem. Speaking of innovation, um, you know, 3M uh, sort of it thinks of and, and projects its innovation model um, based on a focus on the customer leveraging insights from customer engagement and empathy, uh, a collaborative culture that uh, we talk about quite a bit, you know, boundary list sharing. Uh, if you need help uh, and I can help you, then the expectation is whether or not it's on my employee expectations or uh, associated with my business that I make some time and vice versa. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a deeply uh, embedded um, element of the, the value for, uh, or the, the values for the company. And then the technology platforms um, that uh, you know are, are represented here in the, the form of a periodic table, but um, you know, help to capture the uh, unparalleled technical breadth of 3M. Um, we you know, certainly have a legacy in material science and materials processing and materials manufacturing, um, but we've been adding to that uh, list of core competencies and world-leading expertise steadily. So. Um, you know, what, what do those technology platforms do and, and, and represent and how do we take advantage of them? Um, so, you know, as, as one example here uh, with adhesives, uh, one of the oldest technology platforms for the company, we've seen those proliferate into uh, a diversity of thousands of products and I think roughly $10 billion of our sales are, are tied to adhesive production. Uh, so, you know, you see some examples here in safety and retroreflective products. I worked in that business as the manager for a while and then right next to it, uh, digital print graphics films uh, used for branding around the world. If you see uh, an image on a truck or on a, um, a commercial vehicle of any kind, uh, airplanes included, uh, signage around the world, um, the odds are, are pretty good that 3M is involved in making the, the substrate for that. Uh, they have to weather well, they have to be color fast, they have to be conformable, and so there's adhesive science necessary for it. Uh, and then, you know, down to uh, microscopic uh, and increasingly even nanoscopic uh, considerations uh, associated with the production of uh, consumer electronics. Uh, we're, you know, deep into automotive OEMs uh, and, you know, working with uh, some of the world's largest brands in that space. Um, we use adhesives actively for wound care, wound management, and infection prevention, and of course, uh, well known for our, our presence in the consumer market uh, with, you know, post-its and, and scotch magic tape. Uh, command adhesive is uh, sort of a, a more recent 
larger brand edition, but a, a lot of nice uh, creativity and uh, adhesive science associated with bond and debond on demand, um, appropriate for broad-based consumer use and mounting applications where there can be uh, you know, some safety considerations uh, for things that are going to get mounted where people are walking around. So, you know, there's uh, some nice uh, adhesion, adhesive science uh, involved there. So with those sorts of applications, um, one of the value adds for 3M, uh, because there are lots of companies that have deep expertise in adhesives, is that we have these other platforms that are brought to bear as well. And so uh, a few, excuse me, a few examples here uh, are, you know, involving um, you know, high performance window film where we uh, apply our adhesive um, on a multi-layer optical film that reflects selectively uh, infrared light and helps to reduce the solar loading on uh, building interiors, whether commercial or uh, residential, as well as uh, in automotive applications. We have uh, a line of products uh, oriented towards cars, um, but you know, takes advantage of a uh, capability that's unique to 3M in providing uh, wide format, um, highly transparent, but reflective uh, materials that don't involve any metal, right? So a differentiation here, because you can uh, partially metallize films and reflect light, uh, is that we don't create uh, electromagnetic interference with our multi-layer optical films. And so, you know, sort of fundamental differentiation while still providing a sustainability and energy benefit. Uh, in the dental business, uh, we take advantage of uh, you know, our, our deep background in acrylate polymerization, um, but then uh, add into it uh, you know, nanoparticles and ceramics uh, technology that allows for us to make a, a tooth hard uh, you know, a ceramic filling. Uh, it, it starts malleable and you can photopolymerize. So you know, all of the, and it has to be biocompatible. Uh, you know, all of the science around making biocompatible materials that apply quickly uh, and with, uh, you know, low toxicity, uh, a part of the combination of these technology platforms and the deep expertise that's uh, resident in our, our laboratories. So, uh, you know, those are some examples of what 3M does. And so I, I hired into this company that has this model and I, I thought I'd, you know, share a little bit about what I've done. Um, so this was, you know, one of my first uh, assignments in, in hiring into the consumer business. Um, my vice president at the time, you know, asked that I think about how to um, create a new product in the space of consumer adhesives. And uh, so, you know, he said, well, you know, maybe think about, you know, so back to school glue sticks, differentiate there. Um, you know, apart from uh, the, the marketing merit <laughs> of such an idea, uh, you know, the, because uh, those are sold very uh, low in price. Um, you know, I, I did have a chance to work as sort of the startup uh, CTO of that activity, working with a marketer. There were very few resources involved in So we got to decide what to do, where to do, uh, and the claims to, to make. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we ended up uh, formulating was a product that looks different on the shelf uh, in that it was transparent and also performed uh, uh, differently than commodity glue sticks and that it didn't wrinkle paper. And so we, you know, shared uh, this sort of an idea and thought with uh, our, our management and they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Go do it. And we scaled it up in an outsourced manufacturing plant in Mexico uh, and, you know, had a chance to, to have it uh, patented. We, I, you know, uh, largely wrote the patent application uh, and you know, it's been a, a commercial success. Uh, less in the back to school uh, sort of down and dirty, low priced uh, uh, applications as much as in uh, specialty bonding, uh, scrapbooking uh, and, and crafts, uh, you know, sold in, in Target and on Amazon uh, and, you know, margins are pretty good there. Uh, what's interesting here is the mechanism for making a, a solid aqueous gel that bonds paper uh, and doesn't shrink during drying. And so uh, in this uh, upper, you know, uh, uh, image for wide angle x-ray scattering. This is actually uh, a reference um, from a, a, a journal article uh, that's, you know, shown here, Liang et al. Uh, in Langmuir, 
where they studied the crystal structure for um, uh, fatty acid salts in water and in propylene glycol. And so I was uh, curious about why uh, fatty acid crystals are, um, uh, they scatter light in their, they make a white gel in water. And then if you do the same in propylene glycol, thinking about maybe deodorant sticks, um, you know, you have a transparent uh, solution or a transparent gel. And so the, the details seem to be associated with this uh, x-ray scattering hump at the shorter length scales and higher uh, scattering angles uh, that, as you may recall from earlier in the, the slides, uh, you know, directly related to the, the diffuse scattering that we were seeing in some of our polymer samples from my thesis. So uh, a couple years into my uh, career, uh, seeing you know something I tied directly to the training that I had at the department and allowed me to put together a model for the crystal structure for why uh, we're seeing light propagating through uh, and then you know this haziness here would be tied to the refractive index difference between the crystals so then you know what might there be that's uh, non toxic safe for kids or or uh, you know uh, folks to use in home that's going to raise the refractive index uh, cheaply of an aqueous polymer solution and lo and behold uh, sucrose table sugar uh, fit the bill it raises the solids content of an adhesive gel and you have a, a very low shrinkage uh, transparent uh, vis visibly differentiated higher performing uh, adhesive we patented uh, people liked it and gave good reviews on amazon.com and so that was uh, you know sort of a start to finish creativity example. And on the one hand, low stakes, but also low cost, right? And so um, behind the scenes here, the, the year or so that I took in leading this effort, I learned a ton, uh, but I also created value. And it made me start to think about that sort of return on investment activity and how to replicate it uh, and, and how to infuse the thinking around productivity uh, into organizations. And, uh, you know, I was asked to start to do that in future jobs. Uh, my next role uh, was uh, as a supervisor. And, and it was not long after leading that effort that I was asked to become a manager. And uh, I was a manager in the same group where I worked, but I was requested to lead what's called our product engineering organization. Uh, and in that group, um, we had responsibility for driving uh, cost reductions, uh, dual sourcing so that we reduce our supply chain risk, um, helping to substantiate claims or do change management on our existing products if we have to you know, make it a different way so we qualify it so that it doesn't cause quality issues in the field. And as I started the job, our senior leaders in the organization would sit in a room on a monthly basis and go through all of the projects that were um, active and, and prioritized. And so uh, in hindsight, not rocket science to do, but uh, I, I proposed and we adopted a framework for um, delegating the decision-making authority on some of our smaller programs so that people can execute more quickly. And uh, as, as that change in our configuration for operating was made, uh, we surpassed our cost reduction uh, target for the year by 50%, right? So uh, immediately created some value out of uh, making connections a different way and empowering decision-making uh, and uh, autonomy uh, throughout the organization. People felt more energized. Uh, they, they maybe did a little bit more, but then also we were able to harness the, the power of, of that creativity more. Not everything worked uh, quite the way we had intended. Um, you know, the, the very next job that I had, uh, because in that, until that point, you know, I'm PhD out of, out of University of Minnesota, sort of pedigree, I hired into a big company, uh, I had flashed a little bit of leather with, um, you know, driving a product to completion and it was, you know, marketplace success. So I thought uh, with rose colored glasses that I could, you know, go into most situations and, and contribute successfully. Uh, I, I learned a very important lesson in my next job um, because you know, I was hired uh, by one, you know, one of the managers I had pre previously reported to had gone into another job. 
he said, why don't you come over and over here and we'll work on this sort of an initiative. Uh, we were going to work on making um, renewable or sustainable cleaning products in our home care business based on an investment the company had made uh, to uh, produce uh, non-woven substrates using uh, PLA. And um, I, I went in, I took that job with no due diligence, no, no background reading to understand the viability. I didn't check on competitors, you know, so I didn't understand the implications of competing against, for example, a Clorox or a Procter & Gamble who are deep in this space and have already high volume production brand strength and uh, capability to, to sell at very low margins for a long time, right? And so... Um, those are not recipes for success. And as a result, <laughs> lo and behold, we didn't have a lot of success in this area, even though we did commercialize those wipes that are on the left. They didn't stay in the market for a long time. And none of the other uh, products like dusters or uh, floor, floor sweepers to complete, compete with you know, some of the other branded products, they, they, they were not launched uh, at the time. And and so, you know, I wouldn't call that a failure. Uh, I would say that w we, we learned um, and um, I learned some of the ways to anticipate more quickly uh, initiatives that are not likely to be as successful. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as we go forward. So um, that was the only time in my career where I actually uh, initiated a um, you know, a, a search for another position. Um, every other position I've ever taken at the company has sort of been, um, you know, uh, uh, invited or appointed or something like that. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate to, uh, to, to win uh, an assignment in a, a staff group serving one of the uh, business group labs, uh, safety and graphics at the time. And so, in that job, uh, I had a, a chance to work very broadly in uh, sort of a core technology development group, interacting with a number of different line operating units for 3M. And that was as successful as the previous job was challenged. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the scope was well suited. Uh, we were empowered to be successful. We got to work on just the highest priority activities and I got to leverage my technical background very effectively. Uh, and so, you know, we, we touched uh, many of the solutions that are uh, discussed here, uh, including, um, you know, the, the respirators that, uh, you know, have been so much in the news. We didn't invent those, of course. Those have been sold by 3M for a long time, but we made some very material improvements uh, to, uh, to how uh, they perform and, and how they're, they're sourced. I served as the R&D side integration manager for, at the time, 3M's largest uh, acquisition of capital safety uh, is around uh, 2.7 billion dollars if you include all in debt and uh, and the, the capital deployed. Um, and I got a chance afterwards to uh, to serve as the Scotchlight Reflective Materials um, uh, technical leader in the personal safety business, uh, and then moved into uh, my uh, first and only technical director role. Uh, where you have comprehensive R&D responsibility for uh, a division laboratory. And in that group, uh, we provide solutions across the board for uh, commercial entities, uh, whether thinking about their uh, brand presence and the design of the interiors. Uh, products from that business are actually uh, outside of Edmonton Hall from the window film uh, with the uh, dichroic film uh, that, that was uh, installed. Um, you know, the graphics film that I mentioned earlier, uh, floor cleaning pads and a range of cleaning solutions for building service contractors. Uh, and throughout all of this, uh, I'm getting a chance to, through leading teams uh, in a very diffuse way, inject some of the experiences that I've had in previous roles. Uh, so first and foremost, you know, commercialization, success in, in acumen um, and being able to coach teams that way. Uh, but then also, you know, thinking about uh, connection points and applications uh, to, to replicate uh, geographic expansion, the interface with our groups, with marketing, manufacturing, uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, so, you know, certainly uh, having a, a lot of opportunity to grow personally while contributing on a significant scale, uh, you know, going from 
uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, early on in career to, you know, then, you know, billions of dollars in individual products to hundreds of millions of dollars and then billions of dollars on the, uh, on the business group or, or corporate scale. So uh, one, one other thing, and we had a chance to talk briefly about this in the, uh, in the lunch we had with the faculty is uh, the, the increasing uh, digitization of society and the digital nature of technical work. Uh, you know, tried and true uh, polymer scientist uh, and, and chemical engineer, um, that, that world needs to also include an ability to interface with, um, with digital information, to, to leverage data, to manipulate it, to learn from it, to create it uh, in high volumes. Uh, and, and then to create value from it with customers. And so we're getting a chance to do some of that uh, in, in uh, some of the projects that we're working on. And one of my favorites in the lower left is uh, you know, a chance I had to, to supervise a team that had developed uh, visual attention software. You can actually try this for free if you like. If you go to uh, 3M, or I'm sorry, vas.3m.com, so visual attention software.3m.com, you can take any image you like for free. And uh, you can uh, use our software to understand where the eye is going to go first. So uh, the image uh, you know, of me in an office uh, you know, is juxtaposed to the output of that analysis. And you can see where your eyes are uh, typically going to go based on algorithms that we've had a chance to, to deduce through our research. Uh, so this is very uh, useful for uh, brand owners who are maybe designing an ad or thinking about a storefront. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that what you're putting uh, out to attract attention is effective at doing so. And now there's an objective data-based way to do it. And we're seeing some large brand owners having uh, recurring success in, in doing that effectively. So, um, this slide, it, it captures the elements. I'm not going to read through all the words here, but it, it just sort of summarizes what R&D leadership in an industrial setting looks like. And it captures a lot of what I had done until this year in, in my job. You know, uh, R&D strategy, division priorities, um, aligning resources, partnering across the organization, leading commercialization, uh, empowering coaching, helping to um, you know, foster development uh, in uh, employees who are uh, under my charge and, and uh, growing as technical professionals. Uh, so, so that's the, the job of uh, a technical director at 3M. Um, recently, these jobs got a lot bigger through a, a, an organization adjustment that creates global laboratories where people now, regardless of where they live in the world, uh, are reporting up to the global R&D leader if you're working in a business. Uh, as a result of that change, it created space for my current job. And so um, with that organization change, uh, I was asked to serve as the corporate global R&D operations leader that does uh, or has responsibility for most of the other things that are important for uh, the, the global laboratories to function that are not directly tied to a business. Uh, examples can include uh, stewarding the collaborative culture and making sure that we have cross-company events for uh, fostering development. Uh, and this is especially important outside the United States because if everybody's reporting up through their individual business units, there will be no uh, mechanism to cause them to share and engage interpersonally. Um, the facilities that they work in, right, the, the corporate uh, or uh, yeah, the, the customer technical centers, as we call them, uh, that uh, allow for them to have laboratories to collaborate with customers. We have to have someone to manage those and to help to tell the narrative around uh, how 3M innovates and our technology platforms and how we are preferred, preferred supplier. Um, product stewardship and regulatory compliance, uh, the ability to create uh, digital content needs to happen in a facility. So we own uh, those, those uh, responsibilities. Uh, pilot uh, plants, um, processing, um, you know, product engineering for uh, remote locations where uh, we have pooled R&D support so that uh, it's you know, economic to rather than have one person 
in a satellite location serving uh, each individual organization, we can have a, a, a labor pool that allows for us to, to right size that team so that we can provide shared support. All of these shared technical resources uh, are uh, under um, the responsibility of the global R&D operations leader role that I feel now. So, um, so that's, that's what I've been up to um, since January. And uh, I have to say, um, when I was asked to serve the role, nobody had said anything about COVID-19. It didn't exist. And uh, so, you know, it's one of the uh, surprises in, you know, this first uh, R&D vice president role, uh, you know, having a point responsibility, because it makes sense for that to fall into this, this group, you know, managing the, the uh, emotional and tense and, um, you know, very dynamic <laughs> Uh, experience of shutting down facilities uh, for access and then figuring out how to safely uh, resume work uh, with new controls in place has been, you know, part of my uh, great learning experience in the, the first half of the year. And it still is ongoing now. We have, uh, you know, a good outlook around how to manage it. But, um, you know, from a change, change, uh, organization change management and stewardship perspective, certainly uh, an experience um, I'll, I'll remember for the rest of my career. So, um, so I, I just tried to share a little bit about what I've done and uh, I'll briefly uh, share, you know, some of the things that I've treasured a bit in thinking or in trying to uh, influence beyond the scope of, of the job. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, books that have had a big impact, uh, you know, I've, I've shared a few here. Um, the Mindset book is actually the most recent one that I've read, and I wish I would have read that years ago. It would have changed a lot, not just about my work, but also about my parenting and, and other relationships. Um, the idea that our capabilities can be uh, enhanced no matter where we are through effort and coaching and encouragement. Um, you know, this notion of value creation is absolutely essential in my view for leadership, right? And so th this is how we avoid some of those whoops moments where you spend 18 mon months working on a project that's not going anywhere for questions that could have been uh, reasonably asked and answered uh, at the outset. Uh, so, you know, just a, a couple of uh, notes there. Um, and then, you know, the corporate finance, I've actually never read that book, but it captures, I'm sure, uh, the, the essential nugget from it in discounted cash flow analysis and net present value. Uh, that pairs nicely with the idea of value creation. I don't ever or hardly ever go and make a, a DCF calculation, but I absolutely think about how long things are going to take versus the value that's going to come from it. And I try to prioritize and, and lead effectively with that in mind. Across 3M, as well as other companies, um, you know, we, we have a chance to, uh, to impact the, the next generation of scientists and a nice uh, storyline here, uh, you know, around uh, mentoring opportunity I had with Peyton Robertson. Uh, he was the winner of the Discovery Science uh, Young or Discovery uh, Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge. Uh, I served as his mentor and uh, he's now off to Stanford. Uh, but after uh, you know, participating in, in this competition uh, and, and winning and going on to meet the president, um, you know, he has just become such a wonderful young man and his family has influenced mine, uh, you know, easily as, as much as any touch point I, I had with, with him. Um, and I, I, I do a, a good bit of mentoring. You know, this is easily the most successful uh, student that I've had a chance to in, interact with. Uh, but, uh, you know, a really important part of my life story and my career story and my professional, uh, you know, legacy is the number of lives that we get a chance to touch uh, through, um, you know, just mentoring and, and taking time to share experiences that, that we've had. And, you know, that all said, you know, it's still, um, it, it's, all the more important in new dimensions now. Um, you know, as an African-American male, 
uh, and you know senior leader in what's still you know uh, a fairly majority uh, you know uh, populated organization in a state that you know over indexes uh, for uh, you know Western European ancestry and and, and under for uh, you know people of color. Um, yeah, I've, I've been really pleased to see the increased engagement there in the department at 3M and across the country. You know, we want to change the trajectory of uh, racial equity and inclusion in the United States. Uh, the history has obviously been a challenge, right? It's not good. Um, but what's involved in, in, in changing and how do we do that? And so, uh, you know, 3M has been very supportive in uh, and allowing me the space to get involved in some of these other organizations, uh, you know, serving on the advisory board for my alma mater, uh, for uh, Merit Community Services, providing uh, food shelf as well as uh, career coaching for people who, who need it. Uh, Sana Foundation really focused on youth here in the, the uh, east part of the metro, and I already mentioned Minnesota Community Care. You know, broad-based uh, you know, opportunities to, to impact, and I, I try to balance the priority of, you know, working my day job, yes, and being a present father and, and, and husband, uh, but doing what I can in the community. I just wanted to share what 3M is, is doing, um, you know, as, as sort of a representative in, in, in speaking. Um, you know, I know University of Minnesota has, you know, started down on a path. And so, um, you know, we're headquartered here in Minnesota. Um, the reality is that you know diversity is ethnic diversity is more challenged just because of the demographics here versus elsewhere. So um, we are also taking the opportunity to to leverage our national footprint in manufacturing plants and trying to provide manufacturing career pathways, which over time can help to lead into even folks relocating to to Minnesota. Um, you know, absolutely. You know, continuing the the advocacy for uh, STEM training and uh, working to create a pipeline for students of color to go uh, to to get uh, degrees, uh, even potentially at under, uh, or I'm sorry, at uh, HBCUs where we haven't as much made investments, uh, and then having them come back and, and work at 3M, uh, and then. Inside the company, uh, you know, we, we, we have our own work to do at 3M, right? We want to increase our representation, uh, you know, across the board, senior leadership on, on down into the ranks. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're trying to also infuse a culture of advocacy uh, where silence is, is um, not enough, right? Uh, passive interest and in, in wishing for change is not enough. We're, we're trying to create uh, advocates among our leadership and uh, an expectation of people sort of pushing against the causes of disparities uh, as a part of, of leading at 3M. So this is my last slide. Um, I, I, I mentioned uh, there would be a, a bit, you know, in my abstract, I mentioned it would be a bit of, of advice um, that, uh, you know, in my experience is underappreciated uh, as far as advancing in your career. Um, and, you know, so you can read faster than I can talk. Uh, I'll, I'll just focus on just that one point. And for those of you who are uh, graduate students thinking of moving into uh, industry, uh, this is, in my view, the most important thing that I'm going to say today. <laughs> um, as you uh, go into your career and you start working, um, you're undoubtedly going to have interest in other jobs. Um, and so it, it, I can't tell you how many times uh, it's sort of been ironic that people have uh, an aspiration to uh, sort of climb the corporate ladder and move into another role and they go about applying for um, for jobs, uh, which is per perfectly permissible uh, and in maybe some cases encouraged. And it absolutely uh, tends to, I won't say destroy, but deteriorate career prospects long term. Uh, the, the, the best way, in my view, uh, is in winning sponsorship. And sponsorship comes through um, primarily having a vibrant, strong, uh, productive relationship with your manager that results in you being uh, appointed either softly or firmly into 
uh, new roles that help to add capabilities to your background, to, uh, to your competency set uh, that you would not even know to add, right? So your manager and your manager's manager and your management chain, they know more about what you need than you do for progressing in the organization. You have to embrace that, uh, submit to it, and focus on being productive in role until you grow out of that role and create an economic incentive for you to move into another one. That's a very different approach than saying, here's my career map. I want to go after this job, this job, just the job I'm in right now didn't exist uh, before I took it. I had no clue conception. I wasn't applying for it. I was asked to serve in it. Uh, and you know, that's not the only sort of experience uh, that, that that's, that's similar. So, so that's, that's the, I think one of the biggest pieces of career planning advice I offer to mentees is as you focus on doing your job, you can communicate freely with your manager about your aspirations, but allow your management chain to really uh, help you, right? They have a vested interest in your success and, uh, and, and, you know, just, um, you know, sort of patiently uh, engage in that process being transparent. You can be assertive, but allow for them to, to drive it. So. So that's what I have to share. I'd be happy if there's time for you know, some Q&A. Um, if there's any point that you'd like me to expand on, uh, I'd be more than willing. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to have uh, this time with you. And I apologize for a little bit of technical difficulty in the presentation. Well, that's great, Cordell. Um, I'll kick in with that and maybe um, we'll um, allow Dan Prisby, our department head, to, uh, to weigh in and field some questions from the audience. Well, I think uh, if, you have, if you have a question, you can write your name in the, in the chat box and uh, I'll call on you and you'll have a chance to, uh, to ask your question in person. Um, Frank, if I could ask you to uh, take that over because I've got to go teach lab. So I'll get it started and we'll see what comes in here. Well, I'm, I'm also off to the classroom shortly. So <laughs> where's, where's Pedromos? <laughs> I'll be happy to take it over. All right. Oh. Very good. Any questions for Cordell? It's a very nice talk, Cordell. Thank you. Well, Frank and Dan, please enjoy your... Uh, your classes and thank uh, you again. I know you five, have to run. five minutes, five minutes with you, but then uh, I got to get ready. So, um, we have great. a question from Grace Kreske. Yep. Uh, hi. Yeah, I was interested in if, if you anticipated a transition from research engineer to the managerial director side of things. Yeah. Uh, you said you let your manager kind of take the wheel on that and suggest it, but did you? want to go into that position? Good question. At first, no. Um, you know, somebody asked me, uh, not, not a manager, but one of my colleagues, um, a, a senior scientist. So he, he was, uh, he'd been working at 3M 20 years at the time. He asked me if I had thought about management and I said, no, 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 never. Uh, because I was at the time very enthused about uh, being a research engineer and, and growing that way. And uh, that night, you know, as I told my wife about the conversation, she said, well, you know, you really should think about it. And, and so I did. Uh, I had just had this predisposition that this is what I was going to do. And I never really gave any thought to doing something else. And in fact, I had this errant perception that, um, that research or that, uh, that managers were technically just less competent. And so because they were less competent, they went to go do management and real scientists did science. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that's not true. Uh, but in any case, uh, I, I, as I thought about it more, um, I said, well, you know, if I'm asked, I should at least give it a try and, and learn. And increasingly, I saw the, it's just a difference in career path. As a manager, you get a chance to have a, a diffuse touch point on a wider range of things. And so, um, while I don't do all of the work that I you know, reference in my talk, I at least get a chance to understand it and see it and learn from it. And th that's rewarding and engaging. And I, I, I found satisfaction in that plus the, the benefit of the interpersonal leadership and management um, 
and you know getting a chance to hire people into the company and give them a start in their career so all of those things started to appeal to me more and so when when the request came and that's exactly how it did happen it was i i didn't say you know can i apply for this manager job somebody sat me into a room and and said we'd like you to do this job i was ready to say yes great ryan collington You're muted, Ryan. Sorry, I couldn't. Yes, thank you for your wonderful uh, talk. My question is related to Grace's. Essentially, I'm curious why, um, or I'm curious if you have any thoughts as to why they asked you to go into this managerial position, given that you hadn't expressed any interest in it before that point. Yeah. Um, I... I can't say why they didn't say, I didn't ask that question. So I'd be conjecturing. Um, that said, now having hired managers myself, um, there are a number of reasons why people sort of choose a candidate, a person to be a manager. Uh, and you know, certainly as I, I mentioned in the, in my presentation briefly, as, as I also shared with the, the grad students at, uh, in the morning, um, I had evidenced uh, a certain you know, combination of business acumen and technical uh, aptitude that is very helpful for uh, managers to, to have. And so uh, I, I hope that a part of the uh, the invitation was a desire to sort of infuse that into a, a larger number of projects. Um, it's a very uh, valuable capability as a leader in an enterprise to be able to um, to help in handicapping initiatives or investments. Right, um, it, that that feeds into prioritization and over time feeds into uh, you know, corporate scale return on investment, and so. Um, it's it's one thing to be technically competent, but that doesn't mean that you're going to work on the right problems. And so the ability to help steer the conversation to work on the right problems, it was, was something I think was recognized in me and, and led to the request. Thank you. Sure. Great. Any more questions? Amber Walton. Hi, yes. Um, I had two questions. Um, sure. One question was about, I'm kind of astonished that you're involved in so much, like the outreach kind of efforts and your role in the corporate company, um, as well as just parenting and being in that family. So I'm just wondering how you were able to balance all of that and maybe practical tips for how you best kind of navigated being invested in so many different stakes um, sure. and yet still performing well and yeah. All right, well, um, yeah, th this is a, a, a good sort of long-term type question to have in the context of a relationship. So I'd be happy to connect on LinkedIn and, and talk about that uh, over time because there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, values and faith would be, you know, a part of it helps you to prioritize uh, what's important and what's not. Um, you know, the, the willingness to let go of money. Um, we didn't talk about that at all. And, you know, this is certainly not the audience to, <laughs> to talk about that too much. Um, but we have to, in order to raise four kids with love and, you know, have, uh, you know, both my wife and I working full time and do all this stuff, you got to pay, right? You have to pay money to do stuff. And so we, we engage in a lot of uh, service provision as a family just to help, you know, get people from A to B or whatever. Um, and, and then the other is, um, you know, tr trying to, I guess, function within bounds. Um, I, I try to swim a few times a week. I try to get to the gym. Yeah, that's my outlet. Um, if you overreach and burn out, you can't keep up the endurance. Um, you know, these boards that I'm on, um, you know, they, they don't take too much time, but the impact is huge, right? Uh, and, and so I'm able to leverage experience from one area into another. 
Uh, and um, it's a, it is sort of a juggling act, but it's beautiful, and it's you know it's a it's just a part of your sort of creative expression. Um, and you know the, the details and the tactical execution of that, I think you know I, I, I'm happy to talk about it, but it does it requires a little time. Mm, got it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I if I could follow up with one additional question, it was on your comment sure. about managers having being able to submit to your manager trusting that they know what is best for you and your professional development um, i'm wondering if that will be the case for all managers or if there's a way for us to kind of discern when a manager is working in yeah. our interest and to have that kind of level of trust because um, mm -hmm, i'm assuming mm -hmm. that's not yep. something we can just take for granted in that relationship yeah, yeah, yeah. you got it so um and it's an important distinction uh, and if i didn't say it your management your chain. management chain uh oh there's a little echo uh oh there's a little sorry. echo sorry we're good okay um so your manager and everybody that reports up through them or that they report up through, uh, it's good to try to sort of have a relationship with your manager's manager, and if possible, even your manager's manager's manager. That's very difficult many times, but um, it, it's really trust in your leadership. And you know, just if if your leadership is bad, then you should leave, right? <laughs> if if you see duplicity, uh, if you see um, you know things that are um, you know, destructive uh, or don't line up with, you know, your, your core values, then you should, you should leave. You should go and do something else that allows you to have peace at night. If that, if that's not the case and you do generally feel comfortable uh, with, with them, then, you know, we're trying to work and understand what it is that you're there for and, and how you can contribute uh, and having the transparent dialogue, it goes a, a, a very long way. Um, and, you know, when, when your supervisory chain is involved, they're able to do far beyond what you could possibly do as far as applying to another job. That's a transactional career management approach and it's just, it's just fundamentally not as effective. So um, it's, it's true that you can have a bad manager at times, but if you have a, if you have one, if you have a bad manager and your, your manager's manager is sort of a, you know, good uh then then you have to also trust that your manager's manager sees that dynamic right so you got to wait that part out um and in the meantime stay productive you, you if you're doing good work you can't hide it and it'll show up and um, there's an economic incentive for companies to reward and accelerate high producers and so that mechanism works in your favor when you wait on your sponsor instead of trying to drive uh, your own recognition, your own credentialing, your own career advancement. It's just a slower path. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. We have one more question in the chat by someone whose mic is not working, Matthew. Could you elaborate on best practices for early identification of failure that you mentioned previously? Thank you for a great yeah. presentation. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, yeah, that, that's a, uh, I, I'd, I'd be happy to chat on LinkedIn about that also. There are some, uh, some warning signals. It's hard to elaborate on those effectively in a short time, but I, I would say um, the, the frame for doing that is that uh, business model generation template. So you think about your value proposition, the resources, your cost structure, revenue sources, channel partner, and you know the elements of a successful business. And that can even be done when you're a service organization like mine. I, my, my customers are the funding um, you know, organizations that are internal to 3M, right? So we service business units with our analytical labs or our product stewardship uh, folks that help to make sure our products are compliant. Um, but in order to, to see the flaws, you know, you have to have a sort of a picture of what it should look like if there aren't any flaws. And so uh, a vibrant business model and being able to answer some of the high level questions about what's necessary for this to create cash, uh, it would be where to start. And where you see, okay, we're not able to generate cash from this 
map um, for this reason, that's where to press. And people who think like that uh, and, and you know, are, are known for thinking like that will tend to be asked to um, influence uh, big initiatives. Thank you.